Hi, and welcome to this session. Uh, we've recorded this between myself, Steve Torso, who's the founder and managing director of Wholesale Investor, and John Sharp, who's the, the founder of Hatcher Plus. Now, together, we've actually formed a joint venture called HNWI, and the whole focus for us is about how we can actually invest more into the Australian ecosystem, but I want to break down what that looks like. Now, before we go into some of the details, I'll just cover how John and I actually met was that we come across each other via John participating in one of the wholesale investor events, I believe it was Capital 2020 last year. And as soon as I saw John's model, and as soon as I saw his unique approach to, to investing into early stage companies, I was absolutely hooked on their model and wanted to be involved. But not only want to be involved, I want to make it available to both Australian investors and also Australian companies as well, because we are super passionate about building ecosystems. And what I love about what John's doing is he's going to companies at the foundation or at the really, really early stage. So, so firstly, welcome, John. Thanks, Steve. Great to see you. You too, mate. I always love having a chat with you. So look, let's just kick off. Like, to, to start this, what are some of your observations about you, what your perspective of Australia and how you see it? And just in technology in general, what are some of your perspectives and observations? Yeah, look, great question. Because I, I think um, yeah, whenever I'm down in Oz and I'm talking with uh, startups and accelerators and VCs, there, uh, sometimes you get the perception that people think that, you know, it's this Australia is not keeping pace with the rest of the world and whatnot. And, and the data that we have shows that's complete garbage. I mean, Australia's got six unicorns on the go at the moment. It's building, you know, most of the new business starts. Australia has a fantastic number of business starts every year. I think net, net about 250,000 um, companies start up. And it's really interesting. If you look at the number of small businesses in Australia, it's roughly about one in 10 Australians are managing a small business. And that's almost identical to what you see in the UK or America other parts of the world so it's it's not surprising that we're actually producing unicorns at, a, at an almost similar rate um, to those guys and when i say similar rate um actually i'm going to just share my screen real quickly here because uh, i i think you, you know that i have a particular interest in making sure that countries are properly represented and uh, so what i'm going to share here is just our sort of famous unicorns per capita data that we um that we accumulate and, and the great thing I like about unicorns per capita is it allows countries to basically, you know, it, it'll, it, it's a great leveling effect, right? Because everyone goes, well, look at China. They're so amazing. They've got so many unicorns. Well, actually on a per capita basis, yes, they're right up there, but Australia has more on a per capita basis. So if you look at this charts telling us, yes, some small countries like Estonia, Malta and Luxembourg, you know, have a handful of unicorns, which is amazing for very, very small places. Israel, of course, we're all aware of as a, as a unicorn factory, um, doing very well. Singapore, where I'm sitting right now, also is a, a unicorn factory. They're doing very well with six unicorns. So basically one per million is the way to look at it in Singapore. But, as, but then you've got like the US, Sweden, Switzerland, Hong Kong, you, uh, the UK, Lithuania, which is another small country. And then you've got Australia, South Korea, Finland, China, Germany. So I think the point I'm going to try to get across here is that Australia is producing some fantastic startups and some fantastic companies that are creating enormous amounts of, of value. So I just wanted to get that point across just, a, just as a, a, a way of, a, yeah. of, of thinking, about, um, you know, thinking about the startup community in Australia and all of these companies, none of these are in the traditional places where Australia is sort of your know, focus, like in agricultural mining. In fact, I just did a quick look this morning. I think only about four and a half percent of startups are in the areas of agriculture, forestry, fisheries, mining, et cetera. So that means 95% of startups are now in the area of services or medical or, or other things. Um, so that's really something that means that we've, as a country, we've really transformed and, and come a Absolutely. long way towards joining this global sort of startup ecosystem. But I, I just think these are phenomenal numbers. And to, to add to that, one of the reasons, like for me, when as soon as I heard your model, as soon as I heard what Hatch Plus is doing, 
what I'm very well aware of is the power of ecosystems. So you right. mentioned that Australia has six unicorns. The funniest thing with WI, we've also worked with com- for the companies we've worked with. We've now yep. have worked with companies that have had six unicorns, five of those being in Australia, one of those also in, in Hong Kong. Brilliant. And a lot of them we worked with at the sort of small cap stage when they were small cap ASX companies. And I think what's also unique about Australia is the role that the ecosystem plays in helping companies not just build, but then the second part is, is that the ASX has also become known as that sort of listed venture capital. So companies yeah. have that opportunity to exit. So whilst that data is focused on private companies, there's obviously a lot of, like we've, from wholesale investor clients, we've seen 63 of our clients go on to exit. Now, the majority of those have gone on to exit to the ASX and gone on the list, right? And you've seen plenty of stories of companies becoming, you know, 500, 600 million, you know, market caps. And so... The opportunity for investors that I see when I look at your model and I love how you've taken, like if you said the the, the best way to summarize this relationship is that you have this perspective of how do you create a data-driven mechanism of investing that is scalable, right? I love that. Love that as a thought process. Our process, our thinking is, is how do we scale capital raising? Because yeah. we're very well, and also do that with active high net worths and also industry as well, because we're very well aware of the power that investors can have in helping successful businesses. Whereas that's, you know, you don't cover that in the data part, but I see it day in and day out with our, with our clients that we actually work with. No, I think it's a great comment and a great way of, 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 of explaining the positioning of, the, of our two companies, because you know a lot about your investors and what they need and what they're looking for. Um, we know a lot about what creates a successful portfolio. And uh, one of the things that we're super focused on is, um, so if you talk to most people that have invested, or not most people, if you talk to a lot of mm-hmm. investors, angel guys, maybe they've invested in three startups and they'll say, oh, I haven't had a great experience with, with angel investing. And they don't understand that the basic data or the basic math around startups is that only one out of every 100 business plans is going to get funding in the first place or venture funding. Um, only one out of every 100 of those companies is going on to become a unicorn and have a really, really big exit. And so the actual odds in in startup land are around one in 10,000. Now, let's assume that you do a decent job of filtering, you're surrounded by good friends who don't show you rubbish and whatnot. And so you're in that sort of seed stage investor pool and you're you're looking at future canvas and judo banks and things like that, terrific but you're still in that one in 100 range there. You can be the best investor in the world and have access mm-hmm. to the greatest seed stage pool of investments that everyone else is investing in. But if you don't, don't go on to then create a diversified pool of, of, of investments, um, you're going to fall into that sort of statistical inevitability of if you only have 10 investments, you have essentially a 10% shot at a unicorn and you may get lucky. And, and I'm surprised at how often I'll turn up to dinner and there'll be that one guy that made one investment in his life and turned fifty thousand dollars into five hundred thousand dollars, and he's the worst guy to have at dinner because everyone just <laughs> believes that yeah, you, know, you can turn fifty grand into five hundred thousand dollars every time. It's just not true statistically. You need to have a big diverse portfolio. So everything that we're building in technology and in in the marketplace that we're creating is is really around enabling that large pool of, of investments to, to occur or, or to be, and, and not just that, to be managed, to be auditable, um, you yeah. know, to have a sane life while managing a large number of investments, which is also a big bugbear for yeah. you know, occasional investors is they'll make an investment in a company and then they don't hear from the founder again forever. And it's super frustrating. You know, and when they're trying to do their tax returns and whatnot, they're calling the founder saying, can you please let me know what's going on at the company? Uh, and, uh, and they get crickets. So what we're trying to do is, is grow up the capabilities there in partnership with people like PwC and yourselves and others that are interested in also solving these problems. And that seems to be working out pretty well. We, we're on the cusp of completing our first fully automated audit at the moment, uh, where of our 118 companies in our portfolio, we're actually gathering all the data um, using mechanisms that we've, we've created programmatically. So it's pretty exciting where we're getting to with the ability to manage this, but 
long-winded reply to the fact that what we're doing is really enabling um, diversification to happen at the individual investor level. Yeah. And I think what you're enabling is access for the investors to a, a, a really fine bunch of companies, several of which have turned out to be unicorns, so that they can put those together in a portfolio and then enjoy the results. And look, one of the things that we've seen lately, John, over, you know, in this space is that a lot of investors at the moment, they're talking about what's happening in the small cap listed space and they're talking about sort of pre-IPO yep. and IPO opportunities. So then what that tends to happen is that tend to can impact companies that are raising capital at that seed stage or at that foundational yep. stage. So for me, the timing of this relationship is really important because we're big believers in contributing to, to the ecosystem. Both of us are. I know you do a lot of talks. I know you contribute. I know you do a lot of networks. We've obviously been doing it for 12 years. And the way I see to, to bring about the highlights of this relationship, you take it's you are taking a data-driven approach into how you invest into companies. And that's based yeah. off the modeling of 6 billion data, you know, you know, a lot of data points over many years from all sorts of data yeah. sources as far as how do you create a predictable, robust return for investors? The second part is, is that wholesale investor has incredible access to companies. You know, we'll see anywhere yeah. from two to 3,000 opportunities a year. You'll see 8,000 plus. So combined, we'll get access to sort of 10,000 plus opportunities per year. Yeah. The other part is that we obviously have investors an investor database of just over 30,000, mostly in Australia, a strong portion in Singapore and then the UK you also have a global network of investors to tap into. So effectively, the way we're looking at this relationship is, whilst everyone is going to focus on the pure money going into companies part, the way John and I have approached this is, is how do you create a model utilizing technology to assist companies to firstly have, um, like what you said, a good governance process, you know, as a simple governance process that doesn't yeah. eat into too much of their time. And then the second part is, is create pathways for themselves going forward for, for raising capital, for strategic partnership, and yeah. also for, for international opportunities as well. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's really important. And, and I think back to the, the first comment you made just there, um, yeah, I think all of us would take bets on pre-IPO companies given the opportunity, um, that we like. Uh, who, who would not want to sign up for a, a guarantee, you know, or not a guarantee, but a probable 30% yeah. uplift or whatever. And, and I would say there's almost a correlation between this and the early days of Bitcoin. You know, 10 years ago, if you got into Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin then, you know, you'd be sitting at somewhere between 200 and 500 X right now um, on that uh, strategy, maybe even more, because uh, in the space of two years there, it went up astronomically back 10 years ago. So I think it's a bit like startups as well. You can probably make money from Bitcoin right now by going in and you might make 10 grand when it goes from 57 to 67,000. Um, terrific. Yeah, that's a good opportunity, one that we'd all enjoy. But it's not, it's not 100x, it's not 500x, it's not 1,000x, it's not like a Coinbase exit, you know, mm. where, where you, you, uh, one of the, the very, very strong VC out of New York put in what 8% of the business at an early stage and got a thousand X and it's now worth 8 billion. That doesn't happen pre-IPO. That happens when you invest in startups. And so I'm very clear in my own mind that yes, there's a great opportunity now if I, if I want to go out and buy some pre-IPO stuff, but that's not going to be the thing that really, really generates a massive amount of wealth for me. That's going to be a nice kicker on my bonus that I get this year or some other um, piece of capital that I put into that. But, it, but I think a balanced portfolio or a balanced approach to creating a portfolio would have some uh, later stage deals in there, some things that look like they're, they're pre-IPO. If you can get allocation now, that's a real challenge. We're meeting with a couple of banks yesterday here in Singapore just talking about how challenging it is to get access to those later stage deals these days. The earlier stage stuff, if you have the, the balls to get in there and, and, and invest in some of these early stage companies, the trick that we've found is you just need to invest in enough of them to have a diversified portfolio because one in 100 of those is going to go on to become a, a billion dollar exit. Um, and if you if you have a, a hundred companies in your portfolio or you invest in in H plus WI, then uh, you know, H plus WI has that same diversified approach to investing in a large number of companies. Yep. And I think that's a key point we have to point out about our joint venture here is that we're actually taking that diversified approach 
and and applying it to to you know to the fund that we're launching together and, and that's and, why and we think that's why we think that's why we would say it's a really good bet because it takes everything that we've spent three years modeling and it's a great expression for that in the aussie context and I'll just add the final part to that. And what I really love about how we've set this up is that not only can investors invest into the fund, but if they want to invest alongside the fund directly into some of the companies, that, then they have that ability. And the reason why we want to encourage that is because year after year after year, we get reminded of the power in which some investors can actually add oh, value yeah. to businesses. And it's everyone likes to focus on when things are going well. Where I've really seen big differences in companies that are listed now that are worth sort of 500, 600 million, I know have gone through periods where they were close to going under, you know, two, three, four times. And it's been the the investors around them, the, 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 in, the, you know, the service providers that have sort of made that difference. So we're very realistic about what the challenges ahead of companies at the, when, when, they, when you're going at the early stage, but we're also big believers in the role that investors can play in being yes. active with the businesses, adding value, and obviously that sort of building that sort of successful long-term opportunity. Yeah, amen to that. I mean, it's not just about the money, is it? I mean, uh, I'm actually having dinner tonight with a family office here that uh, that helped um, a unicorn here in Singapore through very, very difficult early times by just continuing to shovel in a few hundred thousand dollars here or there to keep them alive. Um, that little contribution that they made several years ago is now about 300x. Um, so maybe they put a million dollars into play. They certainly have much more than a million dollars back now from that exercise. Yeah. yeah. So, so look, I, I, I completely agree with you. And, and that level of support, it can be difficult as the investor to sort of bite down and put more money into companies. And you do have to be sensible about you know, when you continue to fund companies. Um, but I think some of the indications are pretty clear. You know, the, you need a founder with grit. You need him to have a solid vision. Um, you need evidence that he's executing on that and he's going to be able to, you know, get to a point where this thing really takes off. And I think if those things are in evidence, most investors will usually continue to support um, the, the company. And I think what we're building together here could be a, a, a really nice catalyst for, for, for many more of those kind of relationships, hopefully. And and continued investment into what is a, a really excellent ecosystem. And as a, as, as a final to this, John, I'd just like to say what excites me the most about this relationship with you is that, you know, I said, I love seeing what you've been able to do with such an innovative approach to, to venture capital. And I think that we are, between us, we're sort of pioneering a unique uh, way in which we're not only investing into companies, but then providing software distribution and also networks of people that can add value to the companies that are being invested into, you know, for that growth. So it's a, to me, it's an exciting opportunity to, to be involved in. I'm very grateful to have come across you and met you and had the opportunity to work with you. Likewise. And uh, obviously looking forward to, to working with the companies that we invest into. Likewise, Steve, really looking forward to that. Looking forward to sitting with you in person somewhere nearby that bridge in the background there. It'd be nice when we can get back <laughs> together again. Thanks so much, John. Really appreciate the time today. Cheers, mate. Have a good one.